Hello and welcome to episode 11 of the Good Game Roundtable podcast. Today I'm joined by the true heroes of the team, the editors. From Good Game, it's head honcho editor, Andrew Hope. Hello. From Spawn Point, it's Rowan Tagami Evans. Hello. And from Pocket himself, John, ladies and gentlemen, Emerson. Hey! Hey everybody, how are you going? Good. How are you? I'm um, tired. Tired. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you had to finish the whole episode today, so, you know, yeah. you get tired. Um, so, other than John, where did all your nicknames go? Where are your amazing nicknames? Oh, my nickname? Yeah. Jedi Shoki. So, Jedi. I'm a big Star Wars fan. It's pretty obvious. He's lying. He likes Star Trek. <laughs> I like both. Andy, I, I think we've I mentioned like on the Star podcast Trek. many times that you are the biggest Star Wars nerd on the team. Yes? Yeah. Would you, would you yeah. agree to that? I think so. I Pete's pretty good too. I mean, anything that I can pick up, he usually can as well. Like any little phrase that someone says, they don't even realize that they're quoting Star Wars yeah. and Pete and I will look at each other and we'll just be able to... Okay, Star Wars battle to the death. Who would win? You or Pete? Uh, me, obviously. But I had to pretend like I thought it might be sort of a it bit de- of a challenge. It depends yeah. if we're going on figurine size. If so, Pete wins. Oh, just, yeah. I'm a not a gigantic oh, yeah. TIE yeah. fighter. Yeah. I mean, there's a, okay. there is a gigantic TIE fighter um, hovering above this round table. It is the altar to this podcast. Rowan, mm-hmm. what's your nickname? Do you, are you on Twitter? Uh, I just actually deleted my Twitter account. Oh. Yeah. But I just made mine. <laughs> That's the wrong way to go about it. You should Twi- have a Twitter, Twitter is, account now. Twitter is finished. Yeah. Uh, rowdy. Rowdy is Rowdy. Rowdy Rowan. Yeah. Rowan no, the Rowdy. No, no, just Rowdy. Just Rowdy. Just Rowdy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good to know, guys. It's because I'm extremely excitable. At- I can, I can <laughs> we, tell that right now. We can now. all tell. Yeah. Oh, Friday yeah. afternoons. Wonderful. Okay, so I just want to start off with your histories, your gaming histories, your life histories. Tell me all about yourselves. Rowan, let's start off with you. Okay, well... I was born in the 70s, so Atari 2600 is the first gaming thing that I can remember, Pong. And then it was, you know, Commodore's uh, first family computer was an Amiga. So it was, you know, just sitting around waiting for Dad to bring home pirated games, the Amiga. Um, All the way back in those days. Favourite game growing up? Favourite game? Um, I didn't really have a favourite game to Warcraft, and I think that that was like as a PC. I had a brief stint as a PC player, but that is kind of in the 90s and haven't really touched a PC since then uh, for anything apart from work-related stuff. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm a console gamer now. Excellent. PS4. Andy, your gaming history, what did you start off with? Uh, the Atari, I guess, playing with my grandfather when I was minded as a two-year-old or so, a three-year-old. By the, the way, I, I just want to say this podcast is great because everyone is older than I am, so this, <laughs> this is wonderful. Yeah, yeah, actually, it's funny. It's the editor's podcast, and when Rowan started talking about you know his his beginnings, I had it all in pictures in my head, so it like sort of we dissolved through like sort of like a blurry <laughs> uh-huh. dissolve. There was a hazy <laughs> lens. <laughs> there was music in the background, and Commodore I could see symbol. yeah, yeah, like yeah, I could see the flares or whatever you know. So, um, yeah, but uh, yeah. The Atari was where I started out playing with my grandfather. Um, asteroids and combat and adventure. And like when an adventure game could just be called adventure because there weren't any other adventure games, I guess. Um, but yeah, and then I've just played everything that I could since then. So I went on to Commodore 64, an Amiga, PC, and mostly um, Sega as opposed to Nintendo. I just didn't have them. So I was a bit of a Sonic boy like Bajo. Did you have a favourite game growing up? Um, I played a lot of games. <laughs> I, 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 I have fond memories of playing like Spy vs. Spy on the Commodore 64 and waiting for it to load on the on the old tapes. Um, Syndicate. I, I liked building up my economy and like taking over the world in Syndicate. X-Wing. I love Star Wars. This is more than one, but... It sort of paints a picture that I like to play all the games. But Excellent. Yeah. John. Yes. How about you? So it all started way back in like 1985. Good year. Yeah. I wasn't born then, but <laughs> I was like four. And uh, you, were, you weren't born then, but I, you were four. <laughs> yeah, I was about four. Does that make you the youngest? I don't know. I was, no, I'm uh, 81. You're the youngest. Yeah, I'm Andy's the youngest. Uh-huh. Yeah. Are you older than Andy? Yeah, Andy. I wouldn't yeah. have thunk it. Really? Really? Only because Andy has kids, I think. Oh, wow. Yeah. 
There you go. There you go. Young, uh, young, John, you're uh, eternally youthful. Oh, yeah. It's it's quite obvious, isn't it? Um, (laughs) So Commodore 64 to start. Uh, Can't really remember playing any games on that, but there's a picture of me as a kid holding a joystick with my tongue sticking out looking with this most amazing 70s wallpaper behind me, which is just etched in my memory forever. Uh, And then just PC all the way. Never had a console growing up. I didn't get a console till I was 25, so I have just been PC master race my entire life and i never want to change (laughs) favorite game growing up yep i've got three that stick in my mind the most all right well you make up for andy and rowan so you can have three all right so my three are it's a long name f117 stealth fighter 2.0 nighthawk it's a by micropose it was a flight simulator uh i played a lot of that and the king's quest games i played that with my mum quite a lot um Fond memories of that, and then Carmageddon. Oh, Carmageddon! Oh, Carmageddon. Good choice. Amazing. Good choice. Because your mum plays quite a few games, right? Like she plays Portal and stuff. I'm and- trying to get her into it. Um, she's taking her time with it, but she's she's going pretty well. She took 17 hours to finish the first Portal. <laughs> that's pretty good. I, I think that's pretty good. Yeah, the the first uh, first five hours were interesting. It was just literally getting her out of the first room. Uh, she struggles with the keyboard and mouse aiming, so she was sort of <laughs> moving her head all around <laughs> and, yeah, couldn't quite make the connect. But um, now she's moved on to Dragon Age Inquisition after finishing Dragon Age Origins. So she missed the second one because I told not to bother because it's shit. She's speedrunning Dragon she's, Age Inquisition. She's speedrunning that. Yeah, um, wow. She's up to 60 hours played and she has finally made it out of the first encampment. <laughs> she got stuck for a long time because she didn't actually realise the map zoomed out another level so she could fast travel that way. But, you know, we know those games, you know, you can just scour everything. Though. Oh, like, totally. You could do that even without... The amount of backtracking she must have done in the one area <laughs> oh to get God. that many hours up must oh be amazing. My God. Yeah, She should have a Twitch st- stream. Oh, it would be amazingly boring. I, I, think really be, I think it'd, it'd be, be awesome. My mum's sitting there with a confused look <laughs> yeah. on her face and the character just not moving. I think that would make up hours of it. John's John's mum's Twitch stream. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll let her know. Yeah, and, pitch it. Pitch and it. She, and she probably won't, but it'll be fine. <laughs> you could get her on Pocket. I think... Uh, yeah. <gasps> oh, get her on down. Pocket and you could play a game with her. No. Oh, John. No, yeah, that John. will never happen. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna pitch that to Pete. I think it'd be brilliant. It it'll, should happen. It'll it never should. happen. I think the audience is going to demand it now. Oh, I'm sure they will. They can demand all they want, but in the end, I'm editing it, and it's not going to happen. <laughs> in the end, it has to go through you. That's correct. All right. I want to talk about education and how you guys got into editing, Rowan. Mm. Tell me about your schooling mm, life. My you shameful know, schooling. Your, well, life. we were talking about this yeah. yesterday, and I think it was yeah. incredibly interesting. Yeah. So, um, yeah, where did you go to school, and how did you fall into editing? So, I'm a high school dropout. So I dropped out of high school in year 11 and went to TAFE and was doing computers, kind of angling to, you know, get going to uni sideways, do a IT course there, computer science. Um, and I was hanging out at a goth club and in Gosford, of all places. And Wait, this- wait, hold on. Golf or goth? Goth. Goth, goth club goth. in Gosford. This is, this is this is Gosford in the late 90s. This is great. This is like a TV nice. show waiting to yeah. happen, like yeah. goth in Gosford. Yeah. So I met this guy, Quentin, and Quentin was like, so, uh, you know, do you want to like share a house together? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And he's like, well, I have this awful story. Um, my best friend left, uh, sorry, my girlfriend left me and my best friend has moved in with her. And I'm like, oh, that's pretty bad, man. And he's like, and they live next door. <laughs> so, and he was like, uh, so, you know, I need, I need a new housemate and blah, blah, blah. And I said, he, he worked at SBS, right? And I said, oh, look, just give me a job at SBS and, you know, sure, we'll, we'll be housemates. And next week I was working at SBS. <laughs> I was doing data entry in the library there. And that was the start of my career in TV. I was 19 and went from that and just... Like they said, hey, do you want to be an assistant editor? And I was like, yeah, sure. You know, and so I team didn't know anything. I was stupid. And, you know, like, and then just kept on being given these jobs. Do you want to do this? And then finally, you know, did videotapes, uh, news editing for years, um, you know, and then, then just one thing led to another. And here I am, ABC. That's, that's brilliant. I mean, 20 the, years later. <laughs> persistence, right? I mean, the key is say yes to everything. Yeah, pretty much. Just, just yeah. say yes to everything and, and that will get you there yeah, somewhere. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you'll 
you know, you, you can fail spectacularly, but so what? I mean, you know. Life is long, man. Yeah. Like, it, it is a marathon. It's not a sprint. So, I've yeah. heard a lot of stories about how people get into television. That is the most nonchalant beginning that I've <laughs> yeah. ever heard. Like, <laughs> yeah. I didn't really want to do it. I just had, yeah. they, 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 yeah. they made me do it. Yeah. Yeah. And you still don't. I needed You're a house, forced right? to. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no. yeah I, I love that, you know, some kids out there who are desperately wanting to, to find their way in, <clears> you know, going, Rowan, yeah. <laughs> just falling yeah. into it. you just got to go to the goth clubs in Gosford. That's yeah. the, I know. That, that, that's like, all these kids are going to end up in the goth kids, clubs at, kids, in Gosford. Those, that club doesn't exist anymore. Okay. Oh, no. Is it now a golf club? I hope it's so. golf club. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Andy and John, you guys actually went to uni together. We did. Right? We, we did. did. Our so. finest work we ever did. We peaked early in 2000. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. First day at uni. First ever day away from home, away from the family. I met Andy. And yeah. you've never been apart since. Well, and we have. It's, you, a, it's a beautiful story. <laughs> that's, if you met <laughs> us then, years. you would not have thought that I was the elder, put it that way. <laughs> Did I have braces on the first day? Yeah, you yeah, did. Yeah, oh. yeah. And braces you were small. I remember. Yeah. 17. I didn't turn 18 till I was in uni. Yeah. It was quite amazing. I used to pick you up and turn you upside down and literally <laughs> shake the money out of your pockets. Yeah. Not so he could get the money. He just liked doing yeah. it. Yeah. Just he, doing he just did it for the kicks. Yeah. 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 But I remember I, like I, I took a crappy, a crappy, crappy like 386 computer and Andy had this behemoth of a computer tower, like it was as tall as him. It was huge. It I had lift it. Well, I could, but it had like twenty hard drive bays in it, so it was just massive. And I remember going over to his room, and he's just like, "Yeah, so I play games." And I'm just like, "Holy shit, yeah, you do. Look at that thing." And so we pretty much bonded over that straight away, like first or second day, and that has kind of led us to here. I guess in you a weird way, programmed into my like Nokia, whatever, oh, yeah, my old, right. old old phone. He programmed into it uh, the Deus Ex theme tune yeah. because that was the... Wow. That yeah, was I remember the, those days. Yeah, game yeah. we were playing at the time. Yeah. That was my tune all through uni. Yeah. Like that three was a great years. Game. I yeah. played that one. Yeah. Da, Andy. Da, 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 <laughs> yeah, that's it. Da. Andy, your dad worked in the TV industry. Yep. Uh, he was in sound. Mm-hmm. Did you grow up thinking that you were going to go into the media industry? Not really. Uh, I was such a big gamer. I, I thought... I, I didn't really think I'd necessarily make games, but just something to do with computers. I thought I'd be either heading into IT or, I mean, this is like I was going through high school in 19, like 98 and 99 of my two last years of high school um, when you're starting to really think about that kind of stuff. And I was sort of thinking something in that area. While I was doing the HSC, uh, my father installed a copy of After Effects on my computer and I'd been actually reading the Penny Arcade comic strip back then and just so I'd had images, you know, to use to put together just for fun and grabbed um, Blink-182 Damn It and made my own little music video, just moving pictures around, twisting them around, making a little story out of the images that I collected from the internet to the music. So I sent it off to them when they were sort of two years into making their comic strip. Obviously now they're a big convention and and everything else and they wrote back to me and said we were thinking about running a competition with fan submitted stuff do you want to finish it and enter it i'd only done half of it at the time so i finished it entered it one um and they sent me out that copy of deus ex that i mentioned earlier that we programmed the well john programmed the music to they sent me out that and some signed copies of unreal tournament and things like that People that we've now interviewed on the show, I had signatures of a Cliffy B and things like that on things back then. But anyway, I, I made that in my last year of, of um, high school and sort of looked at it and was like, oh, yeah, it was kind of fun. And dad was like, oh, you know, that was cool. You could sort of you you do did something well, with that. You, you did want. well, son. Yeah. And <laughs> you, so, have a, you have a future career. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I am your father. Um, so, <laughs> so uh, yeah, uh, I finished high school and looked at my options of courses and went down the media production path, found something called online media production. So it sort of had a mix of web development, IT kind of stuff, got to uni and kind of ignored all that pretty much. I'd been doing that in my own time during high school anyway to make money, but I stopped doing that and just made short films and then headed into media from there. So it was a surprise for my father, actually, and my mother. Um, he was sort of happy we get to talk shop, but, uh, yeah, he d- didn't push me towards it, wasn't expecting it. Um, 
Yeah. Cool. And for our listeners, that rustling in the background is the garbage man. We yeah. always yeah hit hit this point in time on a, on a Friday afternoon. Yeah. So I just wanted to add the degree that you ended up doing was in online media in yeah. Wagga, was it? Uh, no, Bathurst. No. We both Bathurst. went to Chal- both Charles Sturt Universities, those are, but we went to Bathurst and yeah, I was doing online media production. Uh, so yeah, media. Cool. And did you do a lot of filmmaking and production during that degree? Yeah. Yeah, there was a fair bit of it. We um, we did all kinds of styles where we just sort of made like the, one of the early things we did was just made a short film in the camera, just like... We did Dogma style. We just shot like 30-second short film all in camera and then we did little doco pieces and little weird music pieces. Film clips. Yeah, music film clips was my major work. Yeah. I made, a, I made a, a music video clip for this band called Civic, um, which one of the members of is sitting at this table right now. John, <laughs> John, John. was in this band Yeah, as a drummer and singer at the time? Uh, or backup just drummer, singer. backup singer, right. I sang Very the cool. higher pitched harmony bits and like scrunch my nuts up and tried to get yeah. those notes. <laughs> I basically I followed John and his band around uni, just filming them every gig they did. Like they were all mates of mine. They were all the whole band was. Um, There's at my hours. Wedding. Yeah, and yeah, hours. Yeah, and yeah so much. I have I have seen actually. that music video because I think one of you showed me. Or... It's on YouTube. It is. I've yeah, put it, it is. Up. Yeah, okay. it's available. It's great. Little it's... Andy's in there. It's great. So yeah. you guys are so young. Yeah, I remember. Oh. Like, I remember afterwards because uh, I filmed it and edited it, and I remember afterwards showing like you know it at the presentation or whatever at the end of the year, and um, other people in the course, other editors and camera people came up and said, said, "How did you like?" At one point. I had like a uh, sort of a earthquake vibration kind of effect over the band <laughs> towards the last half of the clip. And everyone's like, "Oh, so did you like keyframe that bit by bit, like moving it up and down the picture and blur it and all that?" And then no, I just shook the shit out of the camera. <laughs> so uh, basically, yeah. what Toby did on the promo this week, shake oh. the camera. I don't know if he's there. Uh... Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I look forward to seeing. Hey, it. Did, you know, did old, you, did old you do skills. That deliberately, or was it just like no, the was, modern handheld look? That was deliberate. It was not the okay. Paul Green Grass okay. look. I was going to say, um, I just, I actually, you know, for anyone out there like that's uh, that is interested in making their own things, I actually was watching the making of of uh, a film at the time. I just got the idea from that. It was the oh, what's it called? The one before Requiem for a Dream. Do you anyone Pi. know? Pi. Pi. Thank you. Mm. It was the like DVD commentary mm-hmm. of Pi. When they sort of showed well, that, that camera mount, with yeah, the sort of you know uh, point of view back at the, uh, or the camera's fixed on the, the person, so the background moves as they they stay still. Yeah, there's that, but he also talked about the fact that when there were um, when there was the intense moment towards the end where they're like, uh, there's uh, a drill involved and and, uh, and there's some. I don't remember that. There's, there's, some, there's some drilling into someone's head, and <laughs> they shake the involved. camera to kind of increase uh, the intensity for yeah. the viewer. Right. Anyway. So how did you find your way from uni into the ABC? Uh, well, uh, I did a uh, internship here at the ABC. I did know someone. Uh, there you go. So nepotism. Yeah. Nepotism yep. at kids. its best. Um, I did know someone and did the internship. Did the internship with like another department though. And um, and a couple of months later, they called me and said, you'd be interested in coming in to work. Started in um, audio, recording voiceovers, then went to sound mixing and sound editing, and then made the jump over to, to vision editing. John, you didn't even study media. No. Nah. <laughs> John is very talented, though. Nah. He is. He's super talented. Tell us what you were studying at uni. So... End of high school, I was right into Jeffrey Deaver and I was reading the Bone Collector series and I was like, right, I'm going to be a forensic psychologist. It's uh-huh. just like I'm going to walk the crime scene. I'm going to be CSI. It's going to be amazing. I then studied for HSC by playing Sharky's 3D pool on the computer instead of studying <laughs> and got a score that wasn't going to get me into any Sydney unis, but it got me to Bathurst. And I went to Bathurst because my girlfriend at the time was at Bathurst already. She was already a first year at uni and I was still year 12. That was pretty... I was very happy about that. Uh, We ended up in the same dorm. We broke up. Uh, I did psychology there. I stayed friends with Andy throughout the whole thing. We used to land together all the time. Um, When he went off to become an ABC uh, big shot, I was still... (laughs) I'd flunked a couple of subjects, so I was held back uh, an extra six months at uni. Uh, 
got my degree, didn't want to do psychology at all because it just was, wasn't my scene and I didn't get good enough marks to get into the forensic honours or anything like that. Uh, so I sold mobile phones. It's just such a great, great experience. It taught me so much about myself and people's ability to throw phones at you while you're doing <laughs> your job and how terrible human society can be as a whole to the point where I never, ever want to ro- work in retail again. Uh, I decided, right, I'm going to be an auto engineer because I love music. I've been playing the drums for uh, 11 years by that stage and girlfriend at the time was like, I'm going to move to Sydney to do uh, to find a job. She just finished uni. So I was like, right, I'm going to go to Sydney and study audio engineering. Went to audio engineering and realized I wouldn't be a very good engineer because playing drums for so long without any ear protection, I'd actually lost. So you, everybody can hear from like 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, right? And I can only hear from, I don't even know what my low, low, low register is, but I can only hear to about 14K. So I'm missing the top six. It's all those symbols, man. Oh, yeah, those symbols. symbols. I I can remember the exact point. I was so angry at school and I had a China symbol. I had the earphones off and I bashed the shit out of that China symbol for about 20 minutes. I walked out of that room and I couldn't hear anything for the rest of the night. (laughs) And thinking back, I'm like, yeah, that's when it all happened. That's all the damage. So I did the degree, wound up at uh, Jan's Production Services as a glorified security guard. I was basically in charge of like three to four million dollars worth of audio equipment, making sure it went on the the right tours and building racks and all this stuff. And it was a pretty shit job, to be honest. Um, And I think one of our other friends at uni, Evan, rang me up and said, hey, you want to come work at ABC? I was like, doing what? And he's like, oh, assisting on Catalyst. You'll be working with Andy. And I was like, what's the pay like? And he's like this. And I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> For four months work, I would actually get paid more than a whole year at this current job I was in. So I was like, yeah, I'll do it. So I went and did that. And Andy- Just to jump in, like our pay is not that great. So you must have been on something oh, yeah, it pretty was, abysmal. It was, yeah. like when I say glorified security guard, I really mean it. Like <laughs> right. I was I was literally sitting in a cave with no natural light for eight hours a day looking oh. at microphones. That's, so it's exactly what you do right now, <laughs> except editing. But, but now I'm on a computer and it feels so much better. Um, <laughs> and yeah, and they're like, you'll be working with Andy. I was like, cool. So I came in and I was assistant on Catalyst. And Andy basically sat down with me for a week and showed me all the ropes of Final Cut. And um, I ended up assisting him on a couple of things that he was editing on on the show and... That's when we realized that my three-year degree at university could be taught in a week. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Bum, bum. yeah. It, yeah. It's true. But, but that's, yeah. those three years included a lot of drinking and, and other things Yeah, oh, and well. forming friendships. And, yeah. uh, and in the end, that is what got me the job. Mm. Like, not the training. It was the friendships. So... Go to uni because yeah. you meet the people that will... Yeah. All goth clubs. All, all, all goth, goth clubs, clubs. Yeah. in Gosford. I, yeah. I, yeah. I, yeah. I love that just hearing your stories makes it sound like people just randomly walk into the SBS or ABC all the time and <laughs> yeah. say, hey, what's up? Do you want to work in tapes? Yeah, sure. Yeah. You want to be an editor? Yeah, totally. Yeah. It's mm. great. But it, it's not really like that. Mm. <laughs> not now anymore, I think. it's. Yeah, so that's pretty yeah. much it. That's how we got in. So what makes a good editor? Well, timing's passive important. aggressiveness. Oh, yeah. Passive aggressiveness. Yeah, you've got to be passive aggressive if you want to be an yeah. editor. Passive well, aggressiveness. Yeah. Be- before we hit that, uh, I guess hit the core of that question. Tell me a bit about what you guys do in your daily role. I guess just so our viewers oh. or listeners have a, um, <laughs> you know, a sense of what an editor actually does. Okay, so for what we sometimes affectionately called the big show, which is just good game or on vanilla. ABC2. Yeah. Vanilla, we also call it vanilla. Um, they film it on a Tuesday, but it's the Tuesday before it goes to where. It's probably been discussed in the podcast before. But um, And they shoot in the morning and in the afternoon and there's a couple of hours of footage um, for just the studio elements, not any field stories, not Gus's piece, um, not Nick's piece, just... Bajo and Hex in the studio, and we cut that down to just the best takes um, and get like sort of a, a framework for it, an, an assembly we call it, and we get game footage from the reviewers and put it over the top, put music to it, and that's sort of like a, a review and that sort and, of- And make it look awesome and sexy for television. Yeah. Andy yeah. is the montage king, by the way. If you've seen a good montage in any of the reviews, it's usually Andy's yeah. work. He is. He's a montage, montage. king. Um, Thank you. So, 
essentially you guys, um, same thing with you, Rowan, you guys have about four and a half days to edit an, ep- mm-hmm. edit an episode, right? Mm-hmm. Pretty much that's that's about right. If you if you take kind of like sound mix out, and yep. it's, it's around four and a half days. So for John, he's essentially doing that process daily. Yeah. So, so for me, I get in, I don't know, 8.30, 9 o'clock. Pete's already in. He's already written the script. I read the script. I see what footage we're going to talk about. I go source the footage. I go grab the footage and I go throw it on the timeline even way before we've even shot any rushes and then just approximate. I sit there and actually read out loud how I think Nick's going to say the line and then cut the appropriate amount of overlay and stick it on the timeline so that when Nick finally comes in and delivers, I can just grab that, edit it up really quickly and then chuck it underneath and then it's just a matter of sort of matching it all up. And that takes me, depending on how long they shoot. So today was an ass pocket app, so it was a bit longer because I had to do the After Effects cards and everything like that. But so I came in at 8.30 and I had it all wrapped up by about 1.15. So and I think that brings up one of the key points of being a, an editor in a professional sense is that anyone can edit. You can look at shots and you can pick them and you can put them into an order. Yep. Anyone can do that. But doing it within a set time period is, you know, something else altogether. Yeah. So it takes a lot of practice to do that. Um, to do what John's doing takes years of experience. So it's not something that can be taught at uni or, or whatever. So no, it's, it's not just being aware of what the software is, right? Like, yeah, you know, you can have the no. software skills, but then you have to understand mm. the rhythm of what you're cutting. and Timing like, is absolute key. I mean, I'd say... Like gaming, PC gaming in particular can like give you a big speed bonus. I mean, I I remember like directly transferring the skill of uh, Warcraft to and getting faster and faster and faster and faster using a keyboard um, to editing, you know, uh, in a, on a nonlinear system um, because. You know, and people would go, man, you are crazy fast. You are so fast. And I'd be like, yeah, this is nothing you should yeah. do. Yeah. It's, yeah. All that, it's all that Warcraft, guys. Yeah. I mean, yeah. so. More dots. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, there are, yeah, there are like, you know, just operating the operating computer quickly. I mean, it's a skill that is transferable yeah. from gaming, I guess, to editing. But. Yeah. There's that physical sense of being quicker. And then there's the confidence that you gain with experience. Obviously, you were talking about experience earlier. The confidence of knowing what shot will work where and then there's the understanding of of um you know they're talking about the sequence of shots of, of like cutting from this shot to this shot won't work because they look maybe too similar and it's jarring on the eye and so you might want to go this is pretty simple stuff but it you know you don't starting out you may not know this and you kind of don't know why two shots don't go well together mm. um and it, you know you might just need to go to something wider from a close-up or this mm. you know the, like two um similarly framed interviewees might not work and if you can get away with it you can flip the shot over or flop it but um uh so that they're facing in opposite directions um it sort of helps the uh, you know helps the edits come together just because of the pure amount of content that we produce as a team both weekly and daily how much of what you do is purely instinctual rather than what you think, you know, or what you learn from cinematic language? I'd have to say for me, a lot of my stuff is just autonomous at the moment. I just get in there and I'm just like, I I edit Pocket in a way that I actually edit off the waveform. I don't even look at the pictures. I just literally chuck it on the timeline and I know exactly, like I'll look at three bits and I'll be like, that's three takes. And we always take the last take because our motto is we don't move on until we're happy with it. So that means the last take is always the good one. And so I know that. Then it's just basically a flurry of keys and mouse movements, like an FPS, basically. And then it's just like bang, drag, drop, move mm-hmm. on, move on, move on until it's all just nicely done. And then from then it's just like fine training. But that, that first initial block, it's almost at a point now where I can actually nail it first go without ever actually having to go back and trim one or two frames just to make it sound natural, I guess. But I remember you used to do that on Spawn Point as well. Um, so if people don't know, John actually edited Spawn Point for three years, two and a half. Mm. I can't remember. Uh, From the start? Four? I was 20, there. 2010 to 2013. Four years. 2014. Four, 14, five years. End of 2014. Started so, 2010. So five years. Five years. Five years. And like you, you, I think you are still, in terms of speed, probably the fastest editor on the team, I would have to say. At the moment or the, back then? Oh, I think, yeah, even now and, and back then, I'd say. 
Yeah, I reckon I'm the fastest. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, actually, I, 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 haven't, I haven't watched Rowan work, but I. It doesn't mean that it's good quality, but I'm definitely the fastest to get stuff out the door. I have to be on a daily. Yeah, I think yeah, I think absolutely. you definitely have to be. Um, so it's really interesting when you say that you know you edit off waveforms because you instinctively know that okay, well that's the best take and that's what we're going to go with, and this is where the footage is going to go on top, and mm. that that process is almost automatic, right? Yeah, totally. Which um, goes to your career, Rowan, because yeah. you told me that you worked in news. Yeah, News and Current Affairs. Yeah, I for quite a while. edited Dateline on SBS for many mm-hmm. years. Um, so doing longer format documentary style stuff. And so I edit the same way with audio. Like I look at the waveform. I don't listen yeah. to it for a lot yeah. of, you know, it's just. Because for you. I think all of us yeah. do. And, and especially with Spawn Point, um, because uh, the big show or, or Good Game actually has two editors in Spawn Point only has you, Rowan. Mm -hmm. So you're basically Mm -hmm. most weeks putting together a full episode by yourself and you just don't have that time to think about various things. Okay. Um, Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Or do you? I'm not sure. Uh, Look, I would have to say compared to Dateline, this is pretty leisurely, right? Four four and a half days to cut this half hour is like... Am I not working you hard enough? Is that... We can, like, so so you're saying, saying we can I'm work you harder. Uh, you know, I'm just saying it's not a sausage factory. It's not, It's yeah. you know, I don't have to spit things out at, you know, the last second or whatever. There's a bit more time for to put yeah. some polish yeah. or quality. But one yeah. of the big things that goes into that is actually working on this show is one of the first times I've felt a little bit more, like a- autonomous as an editor, mm. like uh, apart mm. from a uh, food show once worked on. Um, but it... You know, it's like you leave me alone. It's like here, here's the bits, edit it. I'm know? not. I'm definitely not a micromanager. So, so the show gets put together, and then there's one viewing, and then there's the changes from that one viewing, and you're done. Dateline editing was a constant, constant series of viewings from like you know the executive producer, the journalist, the series producer, and they'd all pull the story in different directions, and so you're constantly re-editing bits the best sequences that you worked the hardest on just get, you know, taken out of, and you're like, you know, yeah. it's like, it was so frustrating. Like it's a, it's a really frustrating thing to have editing by committee. Yeah. Right. So it's good to be working in a job where, you know, your hard work actually ends up on the screen. Yeah. yeah. Which is, um, I mean, that's a really interesting point because I think for editors, you guys are basically the gatekeepers, the last gatekeeper of the content, right? So you basically make the content and it pretty much goes to air hmm. once you're done with it. How, how do you cope with the fact that, you know, you've got producers meddling or, you know, you might have EPs, you might have hosts, you might have all these other, um, you might have goose who's sitting in the corner you may have really difficult talent yeah, yeah. um yeah. he's the worst meddler. yeah <laughs> <laughs> because he's actually an editor yeah he's also That's an editor why. it's a pain in the ass <laughs> <laughs> um how, how do you guys cope with um obviously trying to keep your own autonomy and your own vision in it as well whilst trying to collaborate and well being told to, what to do sometimes i think it's a bit of a compromise like there's things that you work really hard on. I remember back on Spawn Point, I was like, yeah, I'm really happy with this review. I'm really happy with this little, like, upsort sequence where I'm showing really lots of good stuff. And then uh, you and Janet will come and go, no, let's get rid of it. I need to cut it. And it's just like sometimes you just like you breathe and you just let it go. But other times if you really worked hard on it, you fight for it. You sit yeah. in there and you're like, no, I think it needs to be in here because of so-and-so reason. And sometimes you can be stubborn and say, no, get rid of it. Or sometimes you understand and you're like, yeah, actually, that makes, that makes sense. Let's keep it in. So an upsort is up sound off tape, S-O-T, and <laughs> it just refers to basically, say, Bajo and Hex are talking about a game, and then instead of showing the gameplay over the top of them, we stop having Bajo and Hex talk, we put a space in the show, and in that space we put the gameplay and we hear from it. So we're hearing hearing the game or, or whatever the overlay is, you know, whatever the... Lin G can edit in an, up, uh, an upsort. What? Sorry? Here. Here, I can, but I'm not going to because I can't be bothered. <laughs> yeah, but, it, you know, imagine us just cutting right now to five seconds of an episode of Good Game or Pocket Yeah. right now. Or just... That would be an upsot. Imagine that it just happened. Okay, now I'm going to have to do it. Hello and welcome to Good Game. I'm Hex. And I'm Barger. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <sighs> Maybe a few gunshots or an explosion. Some birds chirping, some whale noises. Bird. Yeah, but if you're putting them underneath right now, that's just sound effects and yeah. Yeah. atmos yeah. and things like that. Yeah. Atmosphere. We're, we're educating. Yeah, yeah it's just overlays. 
Yeah, it's all everything's over. I, I know what you're talking about, though, with when you work really hard on something and you don't want to mm. lose it. Um, it's happened so many times, and I think we'd, you guys would both agree that you get to the point where you still fight for some things, but you get to the point where you start to accept that. You can, again, with experience, you know that there's that deadline as a professional, as you were saying. Yeah. As a professional, you've got to reach that deadline and you just have to, as they say, leave your darlings on the floor. Kill, kill, kill your, your darlings. darlings. Yeah. Kill your darlings. Well, yeah. And that's where that passive aggressiveness comes that's in right. really handily. That's right. thinking that. Let's yeah, talk yeah, about yeah. that passive aggressiveness yeah, because but... what, what techniques do you guys use to try and defend your work? Hypnosis. Uh, <laughs> no, um, <laughs> you've, I mean, it's like it's a case by case basis, and that, you know, like just because you worked so hard on a uh, on a sequence, you know, if 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 there's no like if if that is the the thing that needs to go, it has to go, and it, it works the other way. You can be working with a director who's bent over backwards to get a particular shot, and they really, but it doesn't make any sense to put it in an edit. And so you're saying, no, I'm not using it. <laughs> it could cost them money yeah. and time, yeah, a exactly. lot of people's effort to get yeah. that shot. Yeah. But once it's funny, you can be, you, you're quite detached from it as the editor and you can give them that perspective or you have to mm. force them to see it sometimes that that hurts what they're trying to create mm. and you have to cut it out. Mm. And uh, I don't know whether you guys experience this, but you can sit, watch, you can be sitting down editing something oh, yeah, I know all, all day Sorry. Right, and it and it looks and feels a particular way to you, and then as soon as the producer and or the executive producer, someone sits down in a chair next to you, and they're watching it with you, it's totally different. It's so you know, and it's like oh, that's oh, that so see it through, good. You see it through. And now eyes. it sucks. <laughs> yeah, it's so. that it's that different energy in the room, right? Yeah. Um, John, for a daily show, working on that, does that make you a lot less precious about what you're oh, yeah. putting out? Yeah, I. I was a cranky boy last year. Like <laughs> first year on this show, I was a very, very unhappy man. And you can ask anyone in the office, and I'll agree. John was it's a, true. F- I could feel it from five floors up. <laughs> yeah, it was it was bad. And uh, I remember having one day with Pete. I remember just having uh, we were having it out. Essentially, I was just like, right, you, if you want to make changes, let's do this old style. Like, I mean, you you leave me to do the stuff, and I, I edit it. But if you want to do it old school, let's do it old school. Sit down with me and tell me exactly what I should put in and out. And so we sat there and we had it out for about five minutes. I was like, how many frames? And he's like, five. And I was like, right, cut it five frames. And he's like, okay. And then where do you want me to put that? And he's like, just move it back five frames. And I was like, do you want me to cut it or move it? And oh, wow, we were bickering. It was amazing. <laughs> and in the end, I, I gave up because I was like, no, you know what? It's Pete's show. He produces it. He know He has a vision. Mm. He has a vision of what it should be. And even if that vision is wrong. And even if that vision is wrong. <laughs> yeah. It's his baby. I accepted that it is his baby. So now what I do is I do the best job that I can. And I think we're almost on the same page usually. I do the best job that I can. He's looking at me right now, actually. <laughs> Don't hate me. Please. And um, and then I'll literally hand it over to him and he'll have a watch over it. And Pete's becoming quite the adept editor. You might have seen at 200 last year. He edited that all himself. He's such a little... Little starlet, aren't you? I was training Pete since he was a little good game scrub assistant. What are you? No, are you learning from the best. Just uh, yeah. he used to sit in my room before he was Mister Pocket Man or yeah. anything else, and he used to watch. We used to talk about a song of ice and fire. <laughs> <laughs> Just <laughs> anyway, leave, Peter. And, and it, yeah. Anyway, so anyway, I, I basically handed over to him, and and he'll go through and and cut some stuff out and. And I just go, yeah, that's cool. That's what you want to look like. No worries. But, I mean, most times he pretty much trims out what he didn't like Nick saying in the first place. And I'm like, that's cool. That's your editorial effort. No worries. That's fine. I, I don't, I'm not here to be that kind of person. I'm just mm. here to give you exactly what you shot, essentially. Do you guys ever use reverse psychology or, you know, add a red herring here and there? So Used to on spawn you know, point. They're called purple ducks. They called purple ducks. Yeah, purple ducks or a yeah. blue elephant or something. Yeah, okay. Oh, <laughs> red boat. Yeah, purple, purple ducks. I, I like purple duck too. Purple yeah. duck yeah. is pretty good. good. Yeah. Purple ducks. So basically, what what that is um, is the editor would you know put something in that they know will be cut out mm-hmm. or they want to be cut mm-hmm. out first, and mm-hmm. then the, yeah, the producers be- aren't looking for something else. Mm. That's yeah. right, because uh, you know if your job is to essentially change things, if you're a, a producer, executive producer. And you know, there's nothing to change. You know, you might feel a little bit useless. I mean, you know, so so you may just change something for the sake of it. And that's just one thing. 
Just that one thing. Just one thing. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Loved work. it. The edit was beautiful. Now, can you just get rid of the purple ducks? Yeah. <laughs> just one thing. It's always Just start just putting one purple, purple ducks into everything. But the amazing relief when they go, no changes, and you're just like... <laughs> <laughs> tears, tears of happiness. Yeah, it's amazing. Right? Yeah, you just get so excited. Yeah. yeah. What's the most challenging part of your job? Waking up every morning. <laughs> <laughs> you start early. <laughs> uh, hmm. I mean, I know Andy, you and me in particular, you know, the big specials that we do are pretty painful. Yeah, I'd say that the specials take it mm. out of me, and when I finish one. Then coming back to do a, a normal episode the next week, which could be a great episode to do, it's sort of like you have to kind of go, oh, okay, back into – so, we, you know, we put 43 out a year, which is not as many episodes as it's pocket, but um, but you do uh, an E3 one hour and you see all the tweets afterwards saying, oh, make it a one hour every week. Um. The quality would just drop if we did that, though. Well, I think so. I think you guys would probably, you know, die or yeah. <laughs> not want to come into work anymore. I remember when we did the GDC special that recently went to air. That was 45 minutes, but um, the difference in making a show like that, and I loved that episode and I wish we could do more of it, it the difference is that unlike what John was talking about where you've got a waveform and a timeline, you kind of know the structure of the show. You know what they're going to say. They're in the studio and it's the last take example, for example. In, in that scenario, the producer and, and the editor are taking that footage from San Francisco, in this case, from GDC, uh, and bringing it back to an edit suite. And there's hours and hours and hours of interview, and you are crafting a story out of it. You're finding what that story is that you're going to tell, um, You know, weaving these different talking heads, these different people that you've talked to together into a story and then trying to cover it with pictures that relate to what they're talking about, hoping that you have those pictures, sourcing more footage from wherever you can get it, capturing more gameplay. Um, I remember it was sort of 4 a.m. on Monday and our episode was going to air, sorry, 4 a.m. on Tuesday. Tuesday and, yeah, we yeah. worked all day Monday and through the night and it was 4 a.m. Tuesday. Our episode was going to air that night. And I still had to export the video file for the sound mix that was starting at, at 7.30. And I was just trying to um, cut a little bit of what Nick was saying to one of the interviewees. He's having a chat with him. I just wanted to just come out at a particular point. And he just took a breath after what he said. And I'm fine with dialogue editing, but he just made that breath. And I was just like, shut up, Nick. <laughs> it's like... He wasn't in the room, but everyone was the enemy at that point if they weren't helping me get the episode done. So, um, yeah, those those are a bit of a struggle. Yeah, it's a sheer amount of footage that you have to deal with yeah. in, in those situations mm. where we basically come back, you know, with 1.2 terabytes mm. of of clips mm. and we go, okay, let's let's try and use all all mm. this footage that we have, but yeah. we, we can't, you know? Yeah. It's yeah. just impossible. And then the next mm. the next worst part of the job is technology. Oh, yeah. no. So, Jeez. It's, you know, I Where mean, do we start? we're in a little bit of a technological cul-de-sac at the moment because, I mean, John's at least, you know. Using, i got no tech issues with right. me. I'm, yeah. I'm pocket yeah. hat. It's great. John, by the way, is working on a standalone Premiere system, whereas oh, we're still gorgeous. on modern Pro day. 7, which yeah. is, you know. I it, talked to you, 20th sorry. Cent, 20th century technology. Yeah. Right. <laughs> anyway. Um what yeah, can I say? It's, it's so, a bit ridiculous. So the most challenging part of of the job is usually technological problems, uh, things failing, going wrong, you, having to rebuild stuff, chase um, footage, stuff, hard drives dying, tape decks not working. Mm. Oh, mm. the joys, Andy, of, yeah. of last week. Mm. Was it last week uh, or the week before? I, I can't it, remember anymore. I think it was last week. I think it was last Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. Mm. And I'm in denial that it ever happens. Um, what are some of the favourite things that you guys have cut? Episodes, segments, bits and pieces? Well, I mean, I could just say, you know, whenever you do a special on Spawn Point, that they're the, the episodes that you, you know, that are the most fun because, every you know, everything else is pretty 
standard and it gets a little bit repetitive and then all of a sudden you get presented with... Yeah, we did some great stuff last year, like the Star Wars special, Jurassic yeah, Park. Yeah, Park, yeah. Uh, Halloween. Yeah, that was actually my favourite, Halloween. Yeah. yeah. I think um, it was, speaking about, you know, going to the edit suite and not really getting it when you see something, like I remember your cut, I think it was the... The first review in the space episode mm-hmm. last year, we did like this Apollo 13 thing and I had something in the script that um, wasn't what you edited, like you did you did it completely differently to what I had in the script mm-hmm. and then I watched it and at first, like as a producer, you, it's a bit jarring because you're like, why didn't you edit to the script, Rowan? <laughs> There's a reason why I wrote it that way. That's a pretty epic um, purple duck, if you ask me. That's, yeah, I, that's yeah, done really I well. had to say a lot of the time I don't read the script because <laughs> I just assume it's shot in... In, in order, yeah, yeah. yeah. But what was really interesting in that um, aspect was when I watched it, I was like, wow, actually this works really well. I think this actually works a lot better than what I scripted or envisioned. And that's another thing that um, comes back to collaboration in terms of filmmaking and production is you try and use the brain power of everyone on your team and everyone brings something different, you know, in their role. So thank you, Rowan. You're welcome. Yeah. John, favourite things? Oh, man. There's just so much, so much stuff I've edited the past year. Like it, even back on the big show and Spawny, I worked on the big show first, mind you. Before that was my first ever gig. My first actual ever, actual real editing gig was on Good Game when um, it was just after Ep One Hundred in two thousand nine. Jeez, the, old days. Yeah, and the editor was gone, and Janet ran by the office and said, "Do you play games?" I was like, "Yeah," and she's like, "You want to edit?" I was like, "Okay, I'll give it a go." <laughs> and it was only me because Andy was off having a kid, so. And then he came and stole that in 2010 and took the job. And then I went to Spawn Point and it was all fine. It was all happy days and I didn't feel like murdering <laughs> you anymore. And um, I, Just, I, you're bros. You're bros. Think bros, about that. Bros for bros. Life. By bros. this stage, we'd known each other for like 10 years or 11 years. So <laughs> it was, literally was like brotherly, like bashing. So did you pick him up and shake him again? Oh, did, it felt did, like just dropping him actually yeah. after oh. picking him like up. More, more dollars would fall out now. Oh, like. many more. And <laughs> dummies and diapers. and. <laughs> Let's not forget that I, I, I taught you how to use Final Cut. <laughs> oh, I'm now the master. <laughs> Who, who's going to teach you to use Premiere? I mean... I mean, John's going to... John. John. John yeah. will do that. Yeah. Yeah. He's going to return the favour. John yeah. will do a masterclass. Oh, yeah, I'll have to do it for everybody here. Um, Favourite thing edited. <laughs> Sorry, like, that was a big sidetrack. Keep, keep thinking. Keep thinking, yeah. Andy. Um, so uh, backtracking on everything that I said about how the the specials are hard, mm-hmm. my favourite thing to cut is the specials. Um, but to change the, it a little bit, uh, we started doing the Name the Game segments, um, like the gag bits at the end of the episode mm. um, each week. And uh, sorry, there was a weird noise then. Um, Ghosts. So we started making these little segments and the f- and uh, they sort of came out of the blue because uh, Ben was just sort of wanted to stretch his, his creative muscles a little bit. And um, the first one was... Uh, Sort of uh, like it's, uh, to me, it was like the end of Aliens when uh, Ripley's going to um, go down and get uh, Newt back, you know. And there's sort of this epic moment, and and um, it's a bit of a mix of that in Casablanca. It was Barjo and Hex, and Hex was getting onto a ship with a big Gears of War gun uh, hands, and he and Barjo runs up and says, "Hex, you know, you can't get on that ship." And it's like, yeah, you know, like there's like a wind machine, I think, and the camera's sort of shaking, the lights going. And he and she says, "Why not?" And he goes, "You got to do one thing first. And she goes, "What?" And it's like, "You got to name the game for this week." And that sort of was the first one, and it could have been the only one. Um, and I put in the most like sort of like like epic kind of music that I could find, and like um, like just big alarm, like uh, is it Klaxon? Klaxon alarm? Klaxon. Yeah, Klaxon alarm sounds, and try to really amp it up because I guess I wanted to do something a little bit silly and fun as well. And Ben sort of like, you know, it, you know, he, he liked the way it came out and so he continued to do more of them and turned them into a bit of a series. And as you were saying with, with Rowan before about how Rowan did something differently and you liked the way it worked, 
uh, often with those, they'd sort of come up with the idea, Ben would come up with the idea not long before he'd shoot them and, he, and he'd put, sort of put them together. And the great thing about them um, with us being sort of left to our own devices to put them together is I would often get the opportunity to put my own spin on them or change them a little bit or you know, use the shots in a different way that wasn't expected to just kind of add a little bit more to it. And, uh, yeah, they were, they were a lot of fun to put together. No, they were great. John, are you ready now? Uh, yeah, I think thinking about the things that I enjoy the most are editing things that make me piss myself laughing. So on Pocket there's a fair few of that. But I think at uh, 100 last year was a lot of fun just because I got to go back through, you know, 100 apps worth of material and literally just find the bits where I knew that I laughed a lot and got to share that with everyone. So I think... Uh, yeah, probably F100 last year was my favourite. Definitely um, not hosting, that's for sure. <laughs> you were pretty good, though. No. no you could definitely do it Let's again. Let's never talk of that again. <laughs> Just like to finish off, I guess, on the philosophy of editing. I've mentioned rhythm before, and I feel like, for, for me, rhythm is really important to editing. How do you guys... Um, hone that? Like, do you guys... Is it is it through practice? Is it through watching movies or television? Uh, definitely both. I know that when I get into the rhythm of an edit, especially a sequence that's a little bit more creative, perhaps like a montage or something in a story, like a field story that we're doing or a special, I actually can, I really can sort of feel it. Like mm. I kind of like start to sort of tap my feet or something like that and kind of know when I'm really getting into it. And I'll do my best work when I'm like, fully engaged in what I'm doing, which is why I guess I love working on good games because I, I love the medium. I like to use movement within the shot. So I, I, it's, it's always sort of a benefit when the camera person gets off the sticks, off the tripod and sort of moves around a little bit because mm. I'll use the movement. I mean, all editors will, but like I really, I personally really enjoy using the movement of the, of in the footage to motivate the cut. So a, a particular, we might have be holding on a particular shot and then there's and it's handheld and there's just like a little bit of a move and it's the person sort of deciding that they've had enough of filming that particular shot and they want to move away from it and I'll use that little bit of movement and couple that with the next shot with it's a little bit of movement on the head of that shot that sort of moves it in giving it a sort of a flow and I sort of once I know that something's sort of working in that way you can sort of like sort of feel the rhythm of it I guess it's um, mm. it's a dance. It's like music. Yeah. Well, it's, mm. yeah. It's funny you say that. There's a book put out by Afters. I, I can't remember the name of the author, but she was she's an editor and she's a dancer and she wrote a book relating editing to choreography. Um, in, in talking about that sort of concept of mm. uh, you know rhythm and, and movement, um, she likened it to dancing. Mm. I likened it to doing a puzzle. Mm. I find it's a lot like doing a puzzle. Like you, you're you looking at all sorts of different things and you're just trying to find that little bit that fits. Mm. And and when it does fit, it you know it, like it feels right. Mm. And mm. there's plenty of times you watch it and you're like, ah, it's just it's just not right or something. And then it's missing. Yeah, and then it'll click and you'll be like, yep, great, that's it, it's mm. perfect. So I used to, people were like, what's it like editing? I was like, it's like going into work every day and solving a puzzle every day. Mm. And that gets really tiring. Mm. Yeah, that's true. It's it's a it's constant problem solving. Yeah, your yeah. brain is, yeah. and then add in like first person shooter skills because keyboard shortcuts. <laughs> you're moving that mouse, especially for me. It's mm. like it's like a race. It's like moving that mouse to get that edit point, and then bang, hitting it and then moving yeah. on, and everything. It's just yeah. It's mm. a digital j- jigsaw with first person shooter elements. Yeah, yeah. it's great and real time yeah. strategy. Yeah. You're, you're trying to evoke emotions in your viewers sometimes. Like you're trying to make them feel a certain way because you're not just doing, we're not just doing the vision editing. We're also, I'm choosing music quite often and, and well, almost always and, and placing that in. And you want them to feel a certain way. And the right choice of music in the right place can make you feel about a certain character a certain way um, or a certain thing that you're showing differently. Um, and I, I, I honestly believe that, that, you know, there is the exact right frame to cut on. Like, it's not just, you know, you when you place, when you start off editing and you start putting a shot in and you might put in a shot for sort of two and a half seconds and then you show the next one for one second because that's how long you think it is. We work in frames and, you know, there's 25 frames to a second and when you're getting into a really tight edit, when you're getting into a really tight cut, 
there is like the exact right frame and you know when you sort of found it of where to cut and it just sort of yeah you just sort of feel it that's great i have a few viewer questions here mm-hmm. first sure. one from mr tobias g venus Tobsy Tobleron <laughs> has asked, uh, what are your pet peeves when working with people who aren't editors? I don't know if I want to say anything. Um, people who smell. <laughs> um, Use deodorant. People who don't understand the process, I think. Like most people that we work with understand the editing process, but the ones that don't and just expect things to happen and expect mm. things to happen quickly, you're just like, you don't get it, do you? I twitch. Yeah. yeah. You just, yeah. yeah. Quite often I'm putting something together and I'll, I'll, I play something, you know, we all do. We all, all editors, they'll play through the same bit, you know, 10, 20, 30 times as they're working on it sometimes if it's like a particular bit that they need to get right. And the, I'll, there'll be a mistake in it, quite obviously, the way I've structured it together. And I know that it's there. And it's like, yeah, I'm getting to that. I'm building it. And it's just... uh. It's funny sometimes how people like to point out, like, oh, you're going to – there's that. I'm like, yeah, that, I'm, that's what I'm building right now. It's like they don't kind of mm. understand. Yeah. Don't, don't touch my keyboard. Sometimes, sometimes as an editor and you're working with other people who aren't editors, they present you with material uh, that doesn't quite get there. And at everyone – I think every editor comes to this point in their career where they're, like, sweating – yeah. Right. And there's, there's a looming deadline and it's just not working. And, you know, you feel like it's your fault. Right. But actually there's a series of like fuck ups that have happened to get to this point. Yeah. Right. Of like bad, bad uh, skill in shooting it, mm. bad sound, um, bad interview, everything. And it's in your lap and they're expecting something good to come Fix out it of in it. Post. Right. Like, yeah. do you dread and, those words, yeah. fix it in post? Yeah. And, yeah. you know, at some point, and then, you know, it's like you can go through a little mental crisis of, is this my fault, you know? Because they're sitting there looking at you going, why isn't this good? And you, oh, I don't know. Mm. There's never enough shots. That's yeah. the thing. Yeah. Is that I always <laughs> want more angles or more overlay. I'll burn through it so quickly yeah. mm. because mm-hmm. they don't understand mm-hmm. that yeah. the 12 seconds that they filmed of that particular angle – I'm going to only yeah. use that shot once and I'm going to maybe only use it for a second and a half. Yeah. Yeah. Like, And that's fine. I want that full 12 seconds, but I need another 12 here and another 12 yeah. there and something else here and something else there. It's there. Yeah. There's never enough shots unless it's GDC and then there's too much. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. too much is better than not enough. <laughs> too much is yeah. better than Any not day enough. Any day of the week. All right, moving on. Um, this question's from Ray. Mm-hmm. Are you able to switch off when watching film and TV? Like not pick it apart? Not anymore. No. I yeah, can't. I can. I can. That's when you know it's good. Yeah. Yeah, it's- yeah. When you're lost in it and it's beautiful and you're not even noticing the editing, that's when you know it's good. So, yeah. I loved the new Star Wars. Uh, I loved it. And I can still remember the digital push in as they flew into the back <laughs> of the bloody Star Destroyer. <laughs> yeah. And it just ruins me every uh, time. Yeah. I'm still um, thinking of it now. No, I'm just, uh, I hate myself for it. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think if it's truly well done. Uh, then it, yeah, the best editing is invisible, and the best sort of like you know filmmaking mm. and television. Uh, it still it happens to me occasionally that I can lose myself in it and and forget about it. But uh, so I'm you know with you there with that on Rowan, Rowan with you that yeah. But uh, I gotta agree with John as well is that a lot of the time you're watching it and you see the cuts or you see how they do something, you think about it. You know, mm. you think about it and what you would have done differently. Yeah, and and yeah. why they didn't do it this way, and yeah. why, and, and it's just the free. thing that gets me is audio yeah. edits. Actually, like I, I actually audio edits get me more than the actual cuts, yeah. the visual edits. Watching news, mm. watching news, oh, yeah. and hearing Any like interviews. jerky, yeah. jerky sentence structure. It's mm. just like, and so they're no, no, no. You're like, whoa, jeez, yeah. you could have tidied that up. Just a cross dissolve yeah. would have fixed that. <laughs> yeah, actually, that I mean, in news and current affairs, like you know, reverse shots and yeah. things like that. It's, pissed me off like we there was a show everyone's seen it at uni these days like frontline yeah where there was the main gag of making fun of this like television news convention of you know filming reverse shots of of the journalist nodding right and they still use them you know it's like it yeah i mean come on frontline is one of the greatest television shows ever made 
Mm-hmm. What I s- it's still relevant. Yeah. It's still, Twenty years that's, on, that's and it's still I mean. relevant. It's still like people still make the same stupid decisions, and it's yeah. just like yeah, there are better ways of doing that. What I seem to notice a lot, and I'm just, what I'm curious about is whether they were happening. 10, 20 years ago, and I didn't notice them because I wasn't in the industry yet. Well, 20 years ago, sorry. But um, is when you see someone talking on camera and it cuts to another angle, it could be a drama, it could be a drama, and it cuts to another person or um, no, another person, but you can still see the other person in the shot speaking and yes, in the reverse. and they're not And their lips yet. aren't synced. They have it, yep. It's not the right words. And they've just they, – the editor has obviously chosen the reverse shot because they like the reaction mm. of what the other person looking at the person talking, mm. like with their facial expression, they like that. But the problem is the person that's talking is still in the frame in the other angle and their lips don't match with the words. And it's only for like like a, a second, but it's it's I don't know how everyone doesn't see it and I don't know how that editor that did that let that through. But you're watching something like that, just for example, you're with your wife watching it, and and then you go, "Wow, did you see that?" And they'd be like, "What?" Yeah, I, that's true. I, the thing I like with people that don't understand what they're looking at, people that don't understand the difference between interlaced and progressive, gets me. I'm just like, look at look how smooth it looks. Now, like faulty towers, for example, is the mm-hmm. best example. I mean, it's probably not progressive and interlaced is probably interlaced and deinterlaced, but all the internal shots of faulty towers is oh, interlaced. Yeah. And then they go to an external. And it's, it's shot on that, film. It's shot on yeah. film. Yeah, yeah. But it has that filmic progressive look, and I'm just like, look at the difference. And they're like, that being I don't said, see it. some pe- like a lot of people don't can't tell the difference when like the image is stretched mm. on a widescreen t- oh, television, yeah. or oh, if man. the motion scan is on on their televisions. Like I, I actually go to people's houses and switch, switch that stuff off. Yeah, like I'm yeah. that person. Yeah. I, I can go to a stranger's house. They could have their television on, mm. and I'm like, just. Just give me your remote. I'm just going to yeah. change something in the menu. Like you, you won't notice, but your viewing experience would be so much better. Yeah, if you're listening at home right now and you have smooth motion oh. or anything like that on your TV, and you bought it because that has that, you can turn it off, and that is a good thing. Yeah, like yeah. turn do, it do off. Do not let your television turn add frames off. to yeah. your content. It's not how it's meant to be. Okay, guys. To send us off to our weekends, the last question from Simon Vin: Is it weird looking at your coworker's face for so long while editing? Do you look at them differently and also in real life? So, John, I want to start with you mm. because I want to talk about the Barge or Nipple app. Oh, right. <laughs> Don't we all? Did that scar you for life? Not at all. No? You no, fine? No, it's fine. Yeah. I've seen worse things. I've seen... An- oh, actually, I don't know if I should say that. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've seen somebody's penis. Um, Mine? What? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We didn't go to uni together. It's hard to remember. I don't know if that was ever on film. Um, yeah, I've definitely seen somebody's wing wang. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah. That that amazing yeah. episode. That was. Yeah. I mean, if you've seen that episode, how I could you? How could you seen... chase that? Yeah. Like, there's no way to chase her that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That's yeah. All <laughs> subtle. Um, yeah. No budgets, nipples. Like, I don't know. That's. Yeah. There's just some stuff you see, and you're just like. To be honest, so he gets he gets shirtless quite often in the does. office. Like it's not just on pocket. Yeah, um, yeah. Seeing Nick's undies the other day was pretty interesting. Um, yeah, I don't think it's too outrageous. I mean, the th- big thing I noticed with Nick is just how much he actually changes in his face and hairstyle across the whole mm. spectrum of the year. It's quite amazing. If you saw him at the end of last year, he was he was sporting an amazing beard. I just will note that it was about faces. Faces. Yeah, not wing wangs or nipples. <laughs> it can be somebody's face, you never know. It's it's fine. I am sure Simon meant that as well. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Faces. Wing no, wang. don't look at um, wing wang, yeah. Never look at Is it wang. weird did you ever have to ed- have to edit yourself? Yes. Is it weird? Yeah, that's weird. Oh yeah. I don't like yeah? that. Yeah. Oh, you had to drink from the noob cup. I had to cup drink from the noob cup. Year. And that was the first time in my entire twenty years of you were television, television that I've had to edit myself. Yeah. <sighs> It was very I, confronting. Hmm. I like seeing it, though. I've never been on the screen, I think, or maybe like... Lies. The, the Christmas episode waving. Oh, you're right. Battlefield montage. Battlefield montage back in like 2011 or something. Mm-hmm. It was just Bajo, John, and I, Steve and John and I, um, saying, just staring at each other with that de- like that sort of we've been through the trenches kind of stare. <laughs> Yeah, I remember that. But uh, more recently, I actually filmed myself in the edit suite because uh, one of the things that we get to hear sometimes is the stuff that happens between takes. 
And when Bajo, uh, between takes in a Star Wars review, like probably one of them, I don't know, uh, said, it's the Empire Strikes Back, right? Not not Empire Strikes Back. Like, I, I almost shut down my computer straight away. <laughs> you always quit your so, job. Yeah, so I filmed myself um, just doing a double take. And then put a little video edit together. This is how I communicate to people when I have strong emotions. I, I edit together a little sequence of me dragging the project of that entire episode to the trash can and deleting it. And then I recorded that video, put it together and sent it to Bajo because I thought that, you know, he needs to learn that, you know, you don't do that. I'm I'm still waiting for your hip hop music video of Nick and Nick at GDC in yeah. San Fran. I hope that happens. Yeah, the, it's gonna um, be glorious. The Steph Armageddon video was a good one too. I really enjoyed that. You weren't in it, but that was a good little video. Yeah, that was good yeah. fun. But I I think I mean I, I might be speaking for you guys, but I don't think it's weird that you you know looked at Hex's or Bajo's face forever, and, and if you you know still no. have a professional experience no. or collaboration with them in person, no, it's, it's just fine. like it's just like working with people every day. You see the yeah. same faces every day. It's just yeah. you see them yeah. a bit yeah. extra. The funny thing is they talk to you through the camera sometimes. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like they yeah. In, in between takes, they'll say, especially when they get to know that you do certain things in the edit, yeah. or they want you to know something. Thing, they'll talk into the camera and then it gets recorded and yeah. the card gets delivered to you and you get to hear it later on. Yeah. It's even weirder in there because I'm in there when they shoot and Nick will say to the camera, John, don't put this in, but I'm actually sitting right next to him when he says it as well yeah. and I'm already listening to that. I'm like, oh, yeah, no worries. And then he says it to me again. I'm like, I already know. <laughs> That's so <laughs> meta. That's yeah. so meta. That's yeah. So- yeah. Yeah. Also, um, Stephen is the first on-screen talent in 20 years of working in TV who actually emailed me to say that he liked my work. Oh, that's said, so sweet. You know, like, so, yeah, I, I can I can handle his face. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay, good, good. We, we should get them to send you more emails, Ron. Yeah. On that lovely note, thank you so much for joining me today. No worries. You guys. As always, you can listen to this podcast on SoundCloud or subscribe on iTunes. If you've got a question, you can tweet me at Eljology. Till next time, goodbye. Bye-bye. Adios. I'll get you, Gadget. Gadget.